Hello and welcome to Chapter 11, Biodiversity and Conservation Biology. Essentially, by the end of this video, you're going to want to have a very good understanding of biodiversity because that's basically uh, what it covers. Alright, so let's start off with uh, examining the three main levels of biodiversity. First off, we have species diversity. That's basically the number or variety of species in any particular region. Uh, within species diversity, there's a couple key terms that you should know. The first of which is species richness. And that basically just talks about the number of a certain species. Uh, the next term would be relative abundance, which is basically the extent to which different species are similar in the number of individuals in any given area. All right, uh, the second of the three main levels of biodiversity is genetic diversity. And that basically uh, goes over the difference in DNA makeup among uh, individuals. Uh, and this is what provides grounds for adaptions in the future. And the third and last is ecosystem diversity. Basically, this is the number and variety of ecosystems, or habitats, or communities within any specific area. So along the same lines, it's important to note that biodiversity is really very hard to measure. And it's, uh, all of the measurements that we do have are going to be based on estimates, because how do you really measure uh, biodiversity definitively? You can't. Uh, and then also, as it is hard to measure, it is unevenly distributed, which makes it more difficult, because one inch away from a place that has no biodiversity can have a ton and it's just sudden and it's all unevenly distributed and it's uh, for that reason very hard to measure. All right. All right, so now let's take a look at extinction. Extinction basically means when a last member of a species dies and thus that species ceases to exist. Okay, a vocab word that you should know and not mix up with extinction is something known as uh, extirpation. And basically what that means is Say a population in a certain area of a species dies, however, that doesn't mean the entire um, species itself is extinct because it still lives in other places. So take for example a fish living in a pond in Menlo Park. That fish does not live exclusively in that pond in Menlo Park, it lives all around the world. However, something happens to the environment in that specific pond and all the fish in that pond die. However, that does not mean that all the fish in the uh, other ponds around the world die and so that species isn't actually extinct. So that's a good example. Um, also, something to note about extinction is that extinction is a natural process. However, the problem is that we're uh, speeding up this process much faster than it should occur. So, extinction, as you can look down here at this graph, even though this is all human impact, uh, extinction is a very natural process. Things are supposed to go extinct. However, with the human uh, pollution and all of this and all of our building and habitat fragmentation, um, we're speeding up the process too quickly. Uh, we have something known as the red list which is basically a list of species that are rapidly heading towards extinction that we uh, make sure to keep an eye out on as well. All right, so now let's take a look at biodiversity loss. So there are gonna be several main causes that we're gonna investigate. The first of which is habitat, habitat loss, excuse me, which is the greatest cause. So uh, when speaking about habitat loss, uh, it can be directly outright habitat loss. So you can think about like clear cutting a fort. So that's direct habitat destruction or it could be something such as habitat fragmentation. When looking at pollution, uh, you could examine air pollution and water pollution and a couple other things as really main causes for losing biodiversity. Because say for water pollution, for example, eutrophication occurs and an entire pond ecosystem is now killed off and that biodiversity is gone. Uh, over harvesting, that's not referring to crops in this case, that's gonna refer to animal hunting. And so basically this is a problem when you're hunting large long-living case-select species, such as like a tiger or something, it takes a longer time for them to reproduce and there are less of them. So if you over-harvest them and poach them, essentially, then they're not going to be able to repopulate and that uh, biodiversity goes down. Now, when you're looking at invasive species, uh, you can see that as biodiversity loss because, say, like the cane toad comes in and completely kills all of the uh, native species and that kills off a lot of biodiversity that was there, and now you only have this one cane toad completely running everything, and that's the only animal. So that's uh, taking up biodiversity in that sense. Um, if you look down here at climate change, climate change is a very general topic, but you could break that into, say, global warming and extreme weather conditions. And because of that, biodiversity is lost for a plethora of reasons, really, if you get a little more specific. All of these can relate to climate change as well. All right, so now let's examine the benefits of biodiversity and why it's actually a good thing. So first and foremost, it provides stability. So the way I can explain this is think about if you have a very, very intricate food web in a certain ecosystem. So say the rainforest, always a very biodiverse place. 
say a certain frog dies off, and there's a lot of things dependent on that frog. What that frog eats, if it's not eating anymore, then the amount and the uh, amount of individuals in a certain community is going to go way up and throw everything off. And it's also bad for the thing that eats the frog, because now they have nothing left to eat. However, if you have a lot of different frogs in the ecosystem, it's much more possible for things to adjust to eating the other frog and getting eaten by the other frog than it is if there are just no other frogs. So that's why it's always good to have a lot of different animals. All right, so now let's talk about uh, ecosystem services. So a refresher on those, that could be something such as pollination, the nitrogen cycle, a natural filtration cycle, really any of that. Uh, when you have a very biodiverse community that's uh, very, very stable, that obviously helps those things happen. So bees are more ready, readily pollinating, um, nitrogen cycles in full swing. It's very, very helpful. Also, all right. Okay, so now let's take a look at medicines. So uh, when looking at medicines, there are actually a ton of natural remedies that we use in our modern medicine that uh, are only possible because of biodiversity. Okay, and now let's look at something known as ecotourism. So ecotourism is basically traveling to go see a natural site. And so that can generate a lot of money and actually be, be uh, very helpful. And so ecotourism um, is really, really important because it generates a lot of revenue for places such as the rainforest. And without biodiversity, it's not possible. Okay, let's take a look at conservation biology basics. So basically, conservation biology is devoted to understanding the factors, forces, and processes that influence the loss, protection, and restoration of biodiversity. So within this, uh, there's a study at all levels, so in the labs and in the field. Basically what that means is that uh, conservation biologists are studying DNA and genes of certain animals in a lab while they're also studying um, entire ecosystems out in the actual field and in nature. So it's a very wide-ranging, uh, diverse field of study. Uh, there are two pretty important environmental laws you're going to want to have an understanding about that uh, relate to conservation biology, and the biggest of those would be the Endangered Species Act. So that's something you're really wanna, gonna uh, want to have a very good understanding of for uh, this course. And so basically, what the Envi uh, Endangered Species Act, excuse me, uh, did was it was passed in 1973, and it basically says that uh, it forbids anyone from harming an endangered species or their habitats. So say something was named an endangered species and uh, put on the list, uh, it's actually illegal for a corporation or even an individual to harm the habitat or the uh, animal itself. Um, another important piece of environmental legislation is something known as uh, CITES sites or um, the proper long name, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wildlife Fauna and Flora. So it's a little easier to know the acronym. But basically what that says is that uh, there's going to be, it doesn't uh, allow any trading of endangered species. So basically poaching. You can't poach uh, like uh, an endangered tiger and sell body parts. That is now illegal and um, protected under the law. Okay, so more efforts. So uh, there's something known as captive breeding, which is basically uh, the captive breeding. So a uh, human-run breeding of certain species within a controlled environment uh, in which the animals are raised to a certain uh, age and then reintroduced into uh, nature. So this is basically used in order to ensure that certain species don't go extinct. So say there is an endangered bird, there's only a couple of them left, you want to make sure that they breed, reproduce, and are reintroduced to nature properly without like being eaten or killed or anything. You could have them uh, captively bred and then aged until they're out of uh, until they've reached maturity and then sent back into nature and so they could prosper and the species could live on. So that's basically how that works. Uh, okay, and then there's something known as forensics, which I'm sure you all know from like CSI and cop shows, but basically it's the same kind of thing. So basically forensics in this case refers to a scientist discovering any illegal poaching and other types of activity in certain areas. They can use DNA and they can detect this and uh, act accordingly. Okay, so now there's an interesting subject known as an umbrella species. So you can refer down here to this panda bear, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. Uh, he represents the World Wildlife Fund. So basically an umbrella species is um, a flagship species. So by supporting this animal very publicly, an organization can ensure that the rest of the ecosystem of that animal benefits. So say um, the World Wildlife Fund in this case takes the panda. By supporting a panda, which a panda bear everyone loves, 
Who doesn't want to make sure a panda survives? By picking the panda, that ensures that the panda's entire ecosystem uh, benefits from getting care and getting money and making sure resources are there. So that's basically how an umbrella species works. Now looking at a biodiversity hotspot, that's basically a way of prioritizing certain areas. So say um, the most important areas would be sensitive areas with endemic species that should receive the most attention. So that's basically just appropriating attention to where it's most needed. Okay, restoring ecosystems and community-based conservation. So uh, restoring ecosystems. It's not just repopulating an ecosystem with animals, but it's actually getting the natural cycles flowing again. It's a full restoration. It's not just sending um, frogs back to a lake that has no more frogs. It's making sure that lake can actually support frogs for generations. Okay, so now let's take a look at community-based conservation. So many local communities in certain countries are supporting efforts of conservation. So in Asia, a lot of different countries are protecting tigers. Uh, this is a good thing for them to do because they do benefit directly. So say a certain region in Asia um, has the capability and the natural environment to support these beautiful animals. Um, if they make sure that these animals stay alive, then they're going to benefit from that ecotourism that we talked about earlier. People are going to come and want to see the tigers, they're going to generate revenue for their town, and everyone's going to benefit. Conclusion. Okay, so basically biodiversity is the backbone of our environment. Without it, everything is unstable. In chapter 12, uh, we're going to examine forest, forest management, and protected areas. See you next time.